Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we did a great show on uh, the Ontario Affordable Housing uh, Task Force and their uh, their um, recommendations. I think there were 55 different recommendations, and I had uh, Leo Margulies, who's head of real estate uh, legal work at Robbins Appleby, and his partner, John Fox, uh, on uh, for that show. And then, surprise, surprise, I got an email from uh, Leo just this week that said, Surprise, surprise, the province has in fact announced a number of proposed changes coming out of the housing affordability report and will actually be tabling legislation. He says they haven't dealt with the most controversial recommendations, but it's a start. So I wanted to have Lior and John back to talk a little bit about this uh, this uh, proposal by the, the Minister of Housing and the Ontario government and what they think is going to uh, come, come of it. John, tell us a little bit about what you think the good and the bad of the current uh, recommendations are, sir. Sure. So the what we're talking about is a bill tabled by Minister Clark. So it's in first reading and it comes out of the affordability task force. And it's it's really a collection of, of relatively small, small ish changes. But some of them are good. Some of them one uh oh and one I am not not too sure is going to have any impact at all. So let me tell you what those are. Uh, I, I think that unabashedly good stuff is is feeding additional funds into the Ontario Land Tribunal to help clear the backlog of appeals to move those kinds of proposals forward. So that's a good thing. Another good thing is better data collection on housing matters developed through this, the, the planning process. Now, th this from, from the, a party that, that took a crack at the census when in, in Ottawa to have better data collection as a foundation of, of um, better policy is a really good thing to see, unabashedly a good thing. And they have this, uh, this, this other piece called the housing accelerator, which I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but it, it seems to mean that a municipality could apply to the minister for effectively a ministerial zoning order. So it would sort of move past local uh, opposition and maybe award based opposition for something that is clearly in the in the in the public interest across the city. So those are all three good recommendations. They've also increased the um, they've increased the foreign buyer tax from 15% to 20%. I don't think that's going to have a particularly material impact on housing supply uh, one way or another. And one thing they've done, which I, I have reservations about, Brian, is they have introduced effectively penalties for municipalities for failing to make decisions in a timely way. And the reason I have reservations is I think, in a sense, he is incentivizing uh, municipalities to say no and to move forward because faced with not having time or resources to complete a review uh, rather than the delay they will be forced to either lose the application fee or say no and since the application fees are part of the overall funding they're pretty much going to be forced to say no and that that causes me some concern uh, because I think it will force more into the OLT than might otherwise be necessary and I think some solid development applications have come through negotiation uh, between municipalities and developers over the course of, of the year. So some, some really unabashedly good stuff, some uh, one reservation from me and uh, one I don't think is particularly meaningful. And there's some other uh, housekeeping material in there as well. Lior, what do you think? Is it a good uh, bill or, uh, no. or not? A anything is better than nothing. So y yes, there are some good things in there. And there's some, uh, there's a whole slew of consumer stuff, which John didn't refer to that's in, in either embodied in this uh, document or in these uh, uh, proposed legislation, or uh, they've been doing at the same time. The, the, the real estate uh, uh, legislation guys at the province have been very busy. They've been dealing with condominium cancellations um, and uh, a review of uh, um, uh, licensing penalties, and that's sort of running in tandem and, and review of the condominium uh, uh, act as well. Uh, and they, they, all these changes are all coming out like at the same time. They, uh, like they're, they're, they've come out in tandem in the last two weeks. So there are things for consumers and there are things for developers. I, I, I you know, yeah, John's basically uh, 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 reiterated what the Tor Tor uh, Toronto's chief planner has said regarding the penalties. If you mm -hmm. don't, you know, what they've said is if you don't, and, and I won't go through the details, but if you don't deal with a planning application within a certain period of time, you have to give back half the planning fees because the fees are quite significant. And if you don't do them within a, 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 another 60 days, you have to give them all back. And so uh, you, you, you're going to see. So the question is, is the city going to be happy about returning funds or are they going to be incentivized to move things along? Um, and will they, as John suggested, uh, just not deal with applications? They'll just say no. So everything is going to go to the OLT. 
Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think part of the problem is the city needs more money and more planners to process the thing. There's no question of that. But it, it, hopefully this will incentivize a, a whole other process that's going on at the city to come up with best practices to move development applications forward in a um, uh, organized and speedy fashion. I mean, right now, there is it, it's a complete mess. A, a, every developer has to deal with 20 different departments to get through any type of development application. The planner is supposed to be the quarterback, but he's, he's not really. He sits there waiting for answers. Nobody pushes through any development application. So if we have incentives, whether these will work or not, I don't know, but it's something because right now we have nothing. And uh, uh, you know, the, if you, you read what uh, Dave Wilk said about the development applications, they're taking you know, 12 to 24 months on straightforward uh, processes. It's not, it's not acceptable. So we got to do something. Is this the answer? I don't know, but that's only, that's only part of the answer. They, they want to throw some more money at the OLT because there's a whole backlog of applications um, that are just sitting there and hopefully that will help. Um, you know, they're going to allow the municipalities to accept bonds seems like a small thing and it is a small thing but again it frees up the ability for uh borrowers uh, or developers to put up security for the the city as opposed to letters of credit they can go to a bonding company uh, which which whose credit facilities uh, you know might be uh, easier to 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 uh to, to get um you know they, they've done one thing which sort of came out of nowhere i i don't know where this came from i i think the ontario uh, builders have been uh, abdicating this. We right now can build uh, up to six stories of wood structures. Mm -hmm. be four, went to six. Vancouver, I think, has it to eight. And there are some structures. We're actually doing one in Barrie uh, for a client. It's going to be five or six stories, but it's going to be something special. And they feel that that's, that's e e ecologically better. And also um, it should potentially reduce costs. So they, they're going to allow up to 12 stories. Uh, which, you know, is, again, an alternative to housing to bring down costs. So those are all good things. You know, the things which aren't there are the controversial ones that we talked about. You know, the as-of-right zoning, um, uh, the, the, the uh, more restrictions on the OLT. It's not $400 for Joe Blow to appeal. It's $10,000. Maybe it's not $10,000, but right now it's $400. Um, a better process for getting rid of frivolous appeals. So there's a lot of things that could be done that haven't been done. Um, and, and this begs the whole question of, you know, they've mixed up some of the consumer stuff in this announcement as well, as I looked at it, in terms of their condominium cancellation um, uh, regulations. They, they announced about a week ago, uh, a continuing unhappiness. Uh, it, it's the one area that the Ford government has been very unhappy with uh, the building industry, with the condominium and low-rise cancellations. And he's... Uh, He's, he's announced some potentially very stringent uh, impacts on builders who can't satisfy uh, the housing tribunal, the uh, not housing tribunal, HCRA, with um, uh, good reasons for exercising their rights. Double the penalties, uh, uh, freezing their ability to build for two years. There's some very serious things that are in the works. I don't know that the regulations are out, but so he's packaged up, yes, let's speed up development. And if we speed up development, Let's make sure that you don't, you know, uh, uh, hurt consumers that have been uh, hoping to get their housing and then seeing it sort of canceled and then paying higher prices. So he's trying to balance both the development side and the consumer side. We're chatting with Lior Margulies and John Fox of the law firm Robbins Appleby tonight about a, uh, a bill that's just been uh, um, put forward by the Ontario government for housing affordability. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with John and Lior in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight about housing affordability in Ontario and a bill that's recently been put forward by the Ontario government. Uh, it's coming out of uh, a task force that was released about a month ago that had 55 recommendations uh, to, uh, to improve housing affordability. On uh, Not all of them, not, not most of them were actually included in this current bill, but some of them were included in the bill. And I guess uh, a couple of other things that came out of... Uh, out of left field or out of other places. Uh, actually, I probably should say right field, not left field, but that's beside the point. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, uh, don't know whether they're going to be able to get the bill through uh, in, uh, in, the, in this uh, current legislature because there's only a month left or so before it gets prorogued for, uh, um, for the upcoming election. But clearly what the Ontario Conservative government is doing is trying to put forward 
some um, attractive policies for suburbanites, I would say, to try to win the 905. And so, Lior, maybe I could ask you, um, do you think this is enough? Uh, you know, what they're clearly trying to do, I think, is uh, with, with Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass, um, with uh, other policies they've come out with, uh, particularly some of these on housing affordability, is they're trying to attract the 905, um, uh, you know, Mississauga, Brampton, Caledon, Vaughan, um, Markham, Whitby, etc. And housing affordability has been unquestionably one of the big issues uh, in the press and, and, and you know, uh, was asked during the federal leaders debate, etc. Is any of this going to actually help, help housing affordability, Lior? Well, I, I think if it's implemented, and again, they've only done, as you say, you know, some of the 55 recommendations from the housing affordability report, but they said they're going to do it annually and maybe even earlier to see, you know, it, it, a lot of those recommendations will require, oh, let me just see here. Oh boy. Uh, let me just check my. No, that's good. Just okay. the closer, the better. Okay. Um, a lot of these recommendations, like the as of right, the OLT changes, you can't do them in, like in, in, uh, in, in quickly. You know, you need some time to work them through. So they wanted to get something out, obviously before the election. That's you know, let, let's be let's be candid. But that's okay. They've got some of the things that they felt they could do now, and over the course of the next year, I believe they will do more. And will they help? I, I think they will. I think. I, I mean, we have to jumpstart the development process. There's been two different philosophies. The liberal philosophy has been to uh, regulate the industry to death. And then when they stranglehold it and prices went up because there was no supply, they said, let's deal with the demand side. You know, let's suppress the demand side. Uh, let's, uh, uh, you know, bring the forward buyer tax and all these other things. That's an artificial way of dealing with it. What the, the conservatives have, have, have focused on is if we have more supply, we can at least ameliorate the, the, the increases and we can give more choice. So whatever we can do to increase supply, whether it's in high rise and density um, or on the low rise side to move things along so that they take they go faster and we have more product in the, in the, in the system can only, can only help. So I, I, I definitely believe that, uh, that the, the, some of these changes may help. I mean, we, we, just to put things in perspective, when we dwell or harp, I know we've, we've said this a thousand times that the development process, both not only in the city of Toronto, most cities and through the province is, is log jam. We, um, apparently there was a study done in 2020 that found approvals take uh, nine to 24 months. And we ranked, we ranked 34 out of 35 OECD countries in development approval timelines. That is a dismal, dismal record. So we got to do something. Is this it? I don't know until we try. You know, I don't know if you read the star uh, the other day, um, uh, Josh Matlow, of course, and his, his band of, uh, of merry men and, uh, and Greg uh, Lintern have said, this is just going to be a disaster. It's just going to freeze developments. We're doing the right thing. We're doing as of right zoning for, for backyards, uh, you know, the, uh, the granny apartments. And I already spoke about that. Yes, you are. And it'll take two years and $50,000 for you to get an approval based on what their program is. So uh, when, we, when the next go round goes, it'll be much simpler. So uh, you know what? It's, we, we knew there's going to be a fight with the city. I hadn't seen it. This is the first sort of public attack because now they've seen the regulations before it was just the housing report it was just recommendations now we see what the province is doing and of course greg uh, lintern the planning uh, chief and 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 the the left-wing uh, councillors on the on the um, uh, council are up in arms which we expected we knew there's going to be a battle um, there's always been a battle and i i think these are good i think they're a start they're not everything but they're a start it says that the government is serious about trying to tackle the problem and the city has not been serious. They've tried, they've talked about the streamlined process. There is a, a group that's dealing with it. It's going on for years, three years, to come up with a streamlined process. When is it going to happen? When my grandchildren are buying stuff? This is, no, we, we need something dramatic. And this report was dramatic. And I think we'll see more after the election. John, what about you? Uh, you said that you didn't think that the foreign buyers tax would have any impact. Um, why? You know, it seems to have had an impact uh, in Vancouver where it was implemented. And uh, foreign buyers tend to be a significant uh, percentage of, uh, of a lot of the yeah. condos, at least in downtown Toronto. But it's, you know, I actually go in with build on this one. Like, I, I think it's a, not a huge uh, segment of the buying population. It's also the only thing in here where there's an attack on demand side 
um, in terms of to, to, to from demand side as opposed to supply. It's our, I think our answers are rare foray into that for, for the government. I, I just, you know, when you look at the grand scheme of the need to deliver additional units, which, you know, Lior has just, just gone on about is, this does that doesn't help that at all, and I don't and I I don't think it's really going to be particularly impactful on on pricing by comparison to lowering supply. Like I, I think the question one of the big political questions is: Are we looking at the whole meal here, or are we looking at the appetizer? And I think what we're looking at here is an appetizer with the main course to be served after the election. And the reason I think that is because it's there's there's enough in here to talk about in the election without completely irritating. Uh, municipalities. It is, you know, it, it, with all respect, Leora, you, you make it sound like it's not a legitimate political tension for local politics to play itself out. In when this has been a tension for a long time, who leads planning in Ontario? Is it led at the local level or is it led at the provincial level? And to sometimes, to their credit, the, this government has has pulled over into pulled that into the into the into the, the provincial sphere through ministerial zoning orders and by driving at supply in a different way than municipalities have been have been accustomed to. Be that as it may, the big stuff here, like the, the one that people will focus on and would have been the most explosive to try and just legislate through is the ability to uh, make as of right zoning changes in established residential neighborhoods to take single family units and turn them into four. That's not unheard of in the world, right? The, 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 it happens in New Zealand to, to some fanfare from the White House, the governor of California delivered that, a similar thing not that long ago. But that doesn't mean it's easy. And, and, and if you want to put a, a, a nicer view on it, it, maybe it is something that the minister feels ought to have a little time for conversation before just bringing it in legislation and plowing it through. And if I were about to launch in my election campaign and I was ahead, sort of 38, 28 in the polls, this last poll I saw, I'm not sure I would need to do much more than he's done in this. And I don't think he needs to solve this. He's going to say to himself the next four months, he gets four more years. He can do, he can be more radical in the first year. It is not unheard of for governments to introduce their most, tr not tr troubling is the right word, but their most uh, potentially explosive legislation or their most uh, politically uh, dangerous legislation in their er early parts of, of larger mandates. So, so yeah, Kim, I think Kim Campbell, the former, uh, Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party who said an election campaign is no time to talk policy. And so I guess you're sort of uh, suggesting she's right to leave the big policy questions for well, after we've won government. I actually don't think he's ignored this policy question, though. And his his Minister of Housing has done has never ignored it. So um, he's putting it on the agenda because he knows it's on the agenda. You know, to a certain extent, he's he's more following um, uh, other leaders uh, would say, there go my people, I must follow them for I am their leader. They, the, the people are leading him into housing affordability because it's a big issue in whether you're 905, 416, it is a common issue across Ontario. We're all looking at whether or not our children can afford the same house we could, kind of amazed by the fact that they can't. We're all looking at our at our employees and places like law firms recognizing that our seniors, our senior legal assistants qualify for affordable housing, which wouldn't have been the case X number of years ago, and facing the fact that a combination of supply issues and equity in, in, in salaries and all that kind of stuff is playing into a very challenging time for us provincially and around the world in terms of, of housing people. And we also have a, have a scenario where we have, we have slightly different philosophical views on housing coming from the federal government and the provincial government, which is merging together to create some momentum. So it's, it's a positive thing. Like even for people in the nonprofit sector who would focus more on below market delivery of housing, pushing down affordability and, and creating more market driven housing at the at the margin is a very positive, positive thing. The more federal and provincial um, resources that are put into the types of housing that cannot be supported on the market, the better. So it should they should not be supporting market. Uh, they should not be doing subsidy to market level housing. And what they're doing through supply is pushing the, the, the base price of market housing down or trying to over the course of the next three to four years, because that's the time it would take to deliver this kind of units on, on, on the market. But if your statistic is right, that we are 34 out of 35 OCD, OECD countries in the time frame to get uh, development uh, proposals approved, isn't that the issue? It's like, that, like that's a, a shocking yeah. statistic. Yeah. That just says that, you know, speed it up, guys, speed it well, up. That, but and that's that's the product of a lot of time of of taking um, 
expertise that, are, that was nested in the public service and removing it over time, right? And saying, well, we, we don't, we're getting poor service, so let's have fewer people. So I, I agree with Leor completely when he says part of this issue is the understaffing of the city of Toronto and, and urban areas, which, which require more expertise and, and people skill to put it. It's not like, if, nobody says there should be no zoning. Nobody says, well, maybe in Houston you say that, but in Toronto, nobody says there should be no zoning or no review or nothing at all. So putting it through, through the process with intelligent people going quickly requires those people to be in place and employed. And so I agree with Lior on that, well, for let sure. Me, let me challenge you on that, Leo, for a second. Um, so I was recently part of a, of a, of a, a city meeting um, on a planning development application. And I think there were 12 different people from the city that were on a uh, call. There was a person from heritage, a person from transportation, a person from transportation engineering, a person from planning, person like, like I couldn't believe all the different departments. And from the development side, there was an architect, uh, a developer, and a planner. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Um, and the architect really was comparable to maybe the planner from uh, the, uh, the, 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 the city standpoint, the, the quarterback, the person that was sort of shepherding the whole uh, process through. Um, so it wasn't, in my sense, lack of, uh, of staff. It was too much staff, too much bureaucracy. People that had a little bit of involvement on whether this was a heritage and whether this was a park and whether this was a light shot and whether this was um, you know, a, a, a traffic problem. And, and the, the minutia of issues that they got involved in questioning was, was surprisingly almost shocking. So it, it's almost not too much staff. It's, it's almost not enough staff. It's almost too much staff that they all get involved in and have to justify their raison d'etre, their, their, their reason for being. All right. Well, so y yes and no. What you didn't say is, yes, there were 12 people from the, you said there were 12 people from the city. Okay, boy, I got to really sit close to this thing. You know, Microsoft, uh, I'm getting an apple next time. Um, uh, yeah, they had 12 people, but I would, I, I would venture to guess it took weeks and weeks and weeks to get that meeting together, to get yes. everybody together. That's yes. number one. Number two is they are short staffed. They're short staffed primarily, particularly in the planning department, because those are the those should be the quarterbacks. They should be the quarterbacks to run the file, to liaise with all those other 12 people that you mentioned. And number three, which is what they're not doing, is everybody's got their own little story and they don't always, you know, plan, uh, uh, transportation wants this, parks wants this. And then, so who, who, how do you resolve those? Planning doesn't do that. And that's what they should be doing. Who does that? The architect or the engineer or the developer. He's got to run around, negotiate with planning, negotiate with each department and satisfy each one of them. It's a horrendous, terribly inefficient process. The city, the, the planner, or you have a super planner, takes charge of that file and he knocks heads together. So if Parks wants this type of road going through and the road guy says, no, you can't put it there, it has to go here. He should resolve it. It should not be for the developer to negotiate with each single guy. That's what takes, that's what, that's, it sounds minutia. That's what takes months and years. I did a file. I don't do a lot of municipal work. I do, I, I, I leave that for municipal lawyers, but I got involved in a file for a developer on a condo. Simple stuff. We were giving easements, private easements or, or public easements to the city over certain private roads to access a conservation authority. So uh, a vehicular, and pedestrian. It doesn't sound very complicated, does it? We had condominium approvals in February of 21. Um, these things had to be sorted out. It went from, people were in occupation in their condo, not registered, but we built it. But we can't register until we settled the condominium conditions. We didn't get our condominium conditions, which were basically settled in February of 21, issued until December of 21, primarily because of this I hate to be simple, but bullshit on dealing with the wording and the postponement from Bell. And it's all, it was all, there was no argument over anything, but the wording and the procedure. So this is just one little microsm. So take a developer has to deal with that 20 times. And that's the problem. So that's why the, some of these things where they say, if it takes too long, you're giving them the money back and it's going to go to OLT. It, it's it's got to force the city to come to a conclusion and it's got to force the city to change its process. And they can do it. They just have to have the will. Do you have to hit them over the head? I don't know, but you got to do something. Is that like you said those 12 people? It probably took two months to get it, and it'll take another three months till you get the comments back, and then four months to sort them out. This is the problem. So there are people there. 
And, but number two, and I, 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 I'm sorry I'm getting excited, but I mean, that one file made me crazy. I like to get things start and finish, and I like to deal with issues, but at my hourly rate, what I was wasting my time on was, was, was unforgivable. But we had 800 people in, in occupation. I said, you know what? I'm going to tell them all to call the city legal, and they can, you can tell them why we're not registered yet. And that seemed to, I don't, know, I don't know if I made any friends with that, but anyways. Um, the, the, part of the other problem, which, which we haven't addressed, is the political um, um, sticking your nose in to, to what should be professional matters like the planner or the, uh, or the engineering department. We do not, we, we've emasculated, certainly in the city of Toronto, and I, I suspect elsewhere, the, the ability of those people to make decisions. Everything gets political if it's something of substance. The site plan, everything goes back and the councillor gets his nose in. That was one of the recommendations that isn't in there yet, which is take that away from council, from the councillors, those site plan issues, and leave them to the planners. These are the guys that are trained, but give them the authority. They don't have the authority now. So now they're they're all worried of what's what's Josh Maplo going to say or what's John Fillion going to say? And he's going to come into my office. So I, I won't do anything until I talk to him. Or if there's a problem, they tell the developer, go talk to the councillor. That's bullshit. They should be making the decision once we have the zoning and the structure in place. And that's one of the changes they, they recommended. They haven't done it. I sure hope they do. That's the type of thing to cut out this bullshit. It really is. The navel gazing and no one will make a decision. Someone should make it. The planner should be saying, that's it. You, uh, 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 Parks, no, the road's going here. Uh, this is what I think. And that's it. Nobody does that. So you have to negotiate the poor architect that you have on that line. He's got to talk to 20 people and satisfy them and think about it. It's like Henry Kissinger. He's got to go back to Israel and Egypt and here and back and forth and back and forth. It's not a way to do things. Anyways, that's, that, that, that's why we got to change the system. We're chatting with Leo Margulies and John Fox of Robbins Appleby about uh, housing affordability and a current bill in front of the Ontario legislature. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with John and Leo in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with the excitable Lior Margulies and the always prudent John Fox um, about, uh, about housing affordability with Robin's, uh, Robin's Appleby Lawyers um, and a bill that has just been uh, filed uh, by, uh, tabled by the uh, Minister of Housing in the Ontario Legislature. John, maybe I can come back to you. And you were talking about this ability to um, have a municipality put something uh, to the, uh, the LPAT uh, to the Ontario uh, um, Land Tribunal. Um, and, and you were describing it as sort of a, a or, or a ministerial uh, reference, I guess. And, and, and you were describing oh, it as a way of the municipality sort of going above the heads of the ward councillors. Um, yeah. Explain that to me because, you know, my experience, some ward councillors and some mayors, the last thing they want to do is, is object to another ward councillor, because they know if they object once, then that other ward councillor or that other mayor is going to come back on them at some point in time. And so I've been, it's been described to me as it's almost like a fiefdom from, you know, the Middle Ages, where you never got involved in someone else's, uh, um, you know, fiefdom. Um, and uh, the ward councillor in that certain area sort of reigns supreme. And, uh, and in fact, I think I mentioned it to you on a prior conversation, Joe Barrage, a planner uh, with uh, um, Urban Strategies, told me the only way out of this is to have people elected uh, from the whole uh, municipality right. rather than from wards. So tell me how you think this ability for your municipality to actually punt something to the minister uh, is going to help things. So you stole my answer a little bit uh, with uh, Joe Barrage's quote. But before I answer that question, I have to tell you and your listeners that what you just heard from my colleague Lior is what is like my every day you just you just got to hear it and when he is your lawyer that is what you get there is she isn't a different on air Lior and a, as opposed to the Lior of the lawyer so the reason I said when I talked about that housing they call it the housing accelerator it's not just for housing it's for other infrastructure projects that are important to the municipality and so I also said I didn't know how that would end up playing playing out but what I like to think of it as is a means by which where the municipality feels there's a city, uh, something that is in the right, is right for the city, is in the city's overall interest, but there is local opposition that they are then able to move past that local opposition the same way the municipal zoning orders do that. That doesn't necessarily solve the issue that you're talking about. One of the issues in, in ward-based municipalities like Toronto is that relatively small groups have an oversized political clout on how an election for a, for a local 
uh, ward councilor go. So 500 votes here and there is a significant amount of political power. And so if you're in a situation where you're, you're facing that, if you were to, if you were to have councilors elected at large, that influence would be muted somewhat in favor of the, the, the good of the entire, entire city. So whether or not this housing accelerator itself is muted because it's only used in a housing context where the local councillor says, all right, I want this, I just don't want to face the local opposition, so let's do it, and then the municipality follows, or whether it's a situation where other councillors would be willing to say, this is the right thing to do, we should have that housing development in your ward because we have the public land, we have the financing, we can make this happen, and therefore we're going to go over your objection, local councillor, is yet to be seen and would be a, a change in the way we would typically see business carried out. You um, had earlier had commented about, uh, um, actually Lior was the one that had commented about uh, sort of the, the over-regulation from the prior Liberal government um, versus uh, uh, sort of uh, what the current Conservative government was trying to do. Um, John, my understanding is the places to grow legislation that was put in place by the prior Liberal government actually uh, anticipated a lot of the, the, the supply issues that we're currently uh, encountering and had recommended fairly dramatic increases in density in the 416 and even in the 905. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've had people say the problem wasn't the places to go grow legislation. In fact, it was excellent legislation. The problem was that none of the official plans for the different cities uh, and the, 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 uh, the zoning that comes with it was anywhere close to uh, what was laid out in the uh, in the places to grow legislation, um, and the biggest problem, um, from what I understand, is is density around transit nodes and density within what they called uh, the 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 gray zone or the the gray belt, which would be the industrial part of the 905 that is before you get to anywhere close to the the green belt, and that therefore the solution was forcing local governments to actually have official plans and zoning consistent with the, the places to grow legislation. Is there any truth to that? Well, there's certainly truth that there's, there are areas of, oh, there's more areas of overlap than you'd sometimes see when you get just a political analysis of a, of a liberal and conservative. So the, the general, there's general consensus that density is a positive thing. There's, there's still, there's general consensus that building on a green belt is probably not the right thing to do. There's general consensus uh, that um, we need to look hard at, at urban areas and the missing middle. And really the, the Liberals had only just be, begun in that, in that space. It really, it was not quite as hot a topic as it is today. As it is today. Um, uh, one of the mistakes that, that, that I, I thought they had made was, was eliminating the OMB as a decision-making uh, body. Uh, I think that the, 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 the return of that is, is positive and its, its funding is positive. And that, that way, even, even when you have, and everybody's had, both, has, has had both frustrating experiences and positive experiences dealing with municipalities. We just hear more about the, the frustrating ones, but it always has to come to an end somehow. And uh, having a decision-making body is, is, you know, maybe it's just lawyers like to think this, that if you have evidence and a decision maker, that that's a good idea. But I think it's a good idea. And, and I was, when they took that away, that, that put a, a fair amount of difficulty into how you would deliver the supply over, over time, because what's, what's the end point if it just goes back to council? But when it came to urban development, there's, there's a fair amount that is built on that work inside the, 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 the government's legislation. And even when you look at what they did, we talked last time on the short time about inclusionary zoning and the inclusionary zoning legislation of the progressive conservative government is a modification of the inclusionary zoning introduced by the liberals. So there, there is some building on. And one thing I actually really like, to, like about the, the minister now, I, I have had a chance to, to, to connect with him at conferences with some of his staff, and they, they've never really cared where the ideas are coming from. They're interested in delivering supply, and if somebody has a good idea, they'll take it from uh, an ex-liberal uh, legislation, if that's where it is, and they'll move on, because they're going to house people if they can. And so that's a positive piece. I, I wish they would focus even more on below market, but they'll take what they can, and that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Lior, um, I, my understanding is that we've never had as many ministerial uh, zoning orders as uh, we have in the last little while. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen the numbers. Um, uh, normally, normally the, um, the, uh, the ministerial orders are not done um, sort of the province 
makes a decision and you get a developer comes to the province and says, you know, I'm having problems with the, uh, the town of East Gwillenberry. Can you help me out on this uh, zoning order? And they get it. That's not what happens. There's been a lot more because the, the province has taken a much more active role in trying to develop supply. So where they, they, there have been a lot of them, but most of them from, from my limited knowledge are situations where um, a lot of times you have two municipalities and you have a property that's, that's straddling the two or the development area. So you need the province to step in and zone the whole thing not, because coordinating between two municipalities is, you know, even in one municipality is a problem too, you can imagine. But I think it, it evidences a desire by the province to um, uh, get things done where there are roadblocks. They don't generally come in and overrule a city uh, you know, where the zoning has been turned down and say, okay, we're gonna do it ourselves and put in a zoning order. I haven't heard too many of those. The only time it's happened, and it wasn't through a zoning order, I think I mentioned this, was through uh, the, uh, the Young Eglinton uh, uh, revisions and the downtown corridor where the city did an end run on the uh, development industry, changed them dramatically from three years of discussions, down zoned the Young Eglinton area, limited the uh, high buildings downtown, and sent it to the province for approval without an appeal to the OLT. And they did it at a time when the liberals were leaving and the, and the uh, uh, province was coming in. And there, uh, the province, rather than either approving it or not approving it, said, you know what? This is an important enough as uh, area. Young Eglinton is huge and the downtown is huge. We're going to put in what we think is right. So they actually created their own zoning, superimposed it, it basically threw out what the city had done or amended it dramatically and imposed it. So uh, that was the only time I've seen uh, the city, uh, the province really run roughshod over the city, but they deserved it because they, they, they ran roughshod over the um, uh, uh, public process uh, and I won't go into that again, but that's unusual. That is very unusual. The ministerial zoning owners are, are, are intended to deal with jurisdictional problems, and the province is not afraid to, sh to, to, to jump in there. The liberals, you know, they want to be friends with everybody, and then you're friends with nobody. So that's why you're, you're probably seeing more of them. I, I don't think they're, they're imposing their will using the zoning orders. Uh, they, they have used them for areas of where they felt that there was provincial interest or it was part of their mandate and, and they have done it where on affordable housing sites uh, where there was a material amount of that and they, they just wanted to to be able to move that forward. It, it was not commonplace prior to uh, this uh, government and uh, that may be because the minister is an ex-mayor, I don't know, he feels more comfortable doing it, uh, but certainly you see more of it and you love it if, you, if, it's, if it's good for you and you hate it if it's not because you didn't get to say, have your say about it. And um, uh, so use, it's still a sparing thing. It's not like, it's not like we have everybody's development's gonna go to the minister, uh, but it's it's certainly more with the, the this government than it ever has been with, even blue governments, of, blue governments before have not used this power before. John, you Same. mentioned uh, additional funding to OLT. I wonder if you could just take a minute and explain because uh, I don't think everyone uh, understands exactly these different entities, uh, the OMB, the LPAT, the OLT. What what are these um, things stand for and, 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 and what's the difference in the way it's organized today versus what people might have understood in the past? Well, it's easiest to think of the OLT is the new way of saying OMB because the, the Ontario Municipal Board was essentially eliminated by the Liberals and was recreated and called the Ontario Land Tribunal by the Conservatives. So you, you can think of it as a uh, as the place developers go, uh, where, or, or the city goes for that matter, when they want to um, uh, get a final decision and planning evidence is brought forward, how much, how much parking do you need? How much height is appropriate? What's the evidence? Where's the shadow going? And there's an adjudicator who makes a final decision. And so it, it can bring a dispute as to, how, as to what an appropriate zoning for a particular site is uh, to conclusion, and it, it is it is not it's actually a, a pretty Ontario specific thing. You don't see this all over the world, but it is a uh, and a lot of times what you hear people say complain and then you say, yeah, but did they get it right? And the answer is usually, yeah, more or less. And sometimes people complain, well, it's good for developers. And you say, yeah, but did they get it right? And they're like, yeah, pretty much, right? So you know, they've, they've, they all, because they have competing planning evidence in front of them, one person saying it should be this, and saying it should be that, and they're challenged and cross-examined and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot for an adjudicator to chew on and come up with a decision on. So I'm not gonna say every decision is always right. I just say in general, it's right. And, if, and, and for, to those who complain that the developer always wins because they make money off of these things, I say that's not the OLT's job to decide how much money you make on a project. That's, that's a whole other 
kettle of fish, another question. Their job is to figure out what the right zoning is. And is this different than the OMB or, or how no, is it not different? No, really. not really. Oh, okay. the, rules, the rules of the game have changed. They've changed three times. You had the OMB. Then, uh, as John said, they got rid of the OMB and they created the uh, LPAT, a, a local uh, planning uh, tribunal right. authority, and they emasculated that authority. And then the, uh, the, the conservatives came back and rather than calling it the OMB, which would have been nice, they called it the OLT, Ontario Land Tribunal. But right. essentially, they've restored a lot of their powers. And the issue that you raised, uh, 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 Brian, about money, I, I think I mentioned last time, there's a huge backlog. They don't have enough adjudicators. So all these applications are sitting there, which means land supply is sitting there. So if we can throw in some, if they can hire, spend a lot more money and get these applications done, then we can get the properties developed. And, and by the way, when people say, you know, the developer usually wins, they are right. M most times they win. It's maybe one out of two, uh, 10 times, two out of 10 times that they don't win. But why is that? Is it because the, 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 uh, these adjudicators are in their pocket? No, these are actually very good adjudicators and they give a lot of thought to their decisions. What it is, is a developer will only go to the OLT or the OMB and spend the time and money rather than negotiating with the, with the municipality and the ratepayers where, he's, where, where they've hit a wall, number one, and number two, where they feel they have a really good shot because they're now extending the delay by at least another two years by going there. Sometimes it's better to say, you know what, I won't build 45 stories, I'll build 35 and scale back the shadows and get it done and get the ratepayers in the city on side, rather than going to the OLT. So when they do go, they usually go with a winner. And that's why they win. The losers never make it there. Very yeah. rare. But you, you know, one thing to remember is we're talking about supply is if, if a site can accommodate a higher density, and the negotiated solution is a lower density, there's a lot of people who are not getting the homes that would have been built in that space. And so, you know, one of the places where the, the, the sort of nonprofit housing community and, and the, the, the for-profit housing community come together is on density, right? They, you do not want to lose the places you can build uh, because they don't come again. No, you're not going to take down a 40-story building. Uh, right. in 10, okay. 15 years and build a 60 story building. There's no question. We're chatting with John Fox and Lior Margulies. They're two lawyers in the real estate practice. Lior runs the real estate uh, legal practice at Robbins Appleby. They're educating us uh, and have before on some housing issues. Um, we're talking about uh, housing affordability. We're going to take a final break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Bar. We're on Saga 960. The challenge tonight is housing affordability. And the uh, Ontario Progressive Conservative Government has come out, uh, tabled legislation in the Ontario legislature on uh, housing affordability based on the um, affordability task force uh, that uh, was released uh, about a month ago with 55 different recommendations. And we're joined tonight by Leo Margulies and John Fox, uh, the two co-leads of the real estate legal practice at Robbins Appleby. Um, and I thought one would be an interesting way to conclude this would be to ask Lior uh, to pretend he was the Minister of Housing, the Conservative uh, Minister of Housing, how he would pitch this uh, legislation and election, and then turn to John and say, what if you were the critic for the Liberal Party uh, for housing? How would you complain about this legislation? Lior, what do you say, sir? Okay, well, I, I would say, number one, this uh, legislation primarily is focused again on the supply side, which we recognize has to be uh, addressed. Uh, we have dealt with some of the small uh, issues on the uh, supply side with the increasing the foreign buyers tax to, to, to get rid of the speculation from foreign buyers. And also this issue of a vacant home tax. Uh, to, again, uh, it, it, it ties into foreign buyers buying homes or speculators sitting on them. So we've dealt with that. But the, the key items here are to move the development process along and encourage and if it means uh, uh, encouraging them with a stick, municipalities to move forward. But there's a lot more work to be done. This is just the start. The housing report is an excellent report to streamline the development process, to get rid of frivolous appeals at the OLT, to get rid of heritage roadblocks, and to streamline and move forward the development process. This government has a lot more work to be done. This is the start. If we get reelected, we're going to work on all those other recommendations and come out re with recommendations that respect uh, uh, local rights, but not to the extent that the new home buyers are frozen out and we, we lack supply. So that's where we want to go with. And if we're reelected, this is where we're going to go. Excellent. John, over to you. 
I'd say you've had four years, you've done nothing, and this doesn't do anything. So you you raise the foreign buyers tax. How many units that built? Zero. You've you've you say you're going to collect more data. How many buildings does that build? Zero. You're adding money to the OLT. How many buildings that build? Maybe some in five years' time. We need help now. People are looking for homes now. Housing affordability is a problem now, and you chickened out of making more units available in in communities. It's time for you to. Say what you say, what you mean, and do what you, do what you do what you say. What's more, you haven't addressed anything. I've said anything about people who are suffering below the fair market value. They need homes too. It's time for you to stop talking about housing like it's just some commodity, like any other commodity that you buy and sell. It's where people live. People need to live in this province. We're going to house everybody, and it's time for this government to step up and do something about that. You didn't do enough. Boy, something makes me wish the two of you were running for uh, the legislature. Sounds like it could have been an interesting debate. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. Um, I, uh, I think that housing affordability is uh, one of the most critical issues. Uh, during the last federal campaign, it was. Uh, during the municipal election four years ago uh, in, uh, in, in Vancouver, it was ranked the number one issue. In Toronto, it was ranked the number three issue. Um, I think it's going to end up being a really important issue. And I think it's really going to be uh, an interesting uh, case, uh, this, uh, this election campaign, uh, because clearly, I think the Ford government is going to be appealing to the 905. Uh, that's uh, the swing areas that uh, either elect or unelect uh, governments. And a lot of their policies, whether it's this, uh, this um, legislation or the, the Highway 413 proposal and the Bradford bypass, um, some, you know, uh, you know greenbelt, uh, um, uh, um, what's the opposite of restrictions, uh, 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 you know. Listening. loosening of the restrictions on the green belt uh, and other issues like that, I think are going to end up being uh, critical issues during this provincial campaign. And, uh, and I think with inflation and, uh, and, and gas prices, housing affordability is, uh, is going to be one of the biggest issues uh, in this conversation this, uh, this uh, May and June. And uh, Lior and John, Lior Margulies and John Fox, who co-lead the real estate uh, legal practice at Robbins Appleby have given us an excellent review of that issue. Thanks for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, um, even from downtown Toronto, uh, where your fancy legal offices are at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available on briancrombie.com. My videos are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, and my podcasts are on Apple, Audible, Speakeasy, and SoundCloud. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody. John, Lior, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.